Will the credit crunch change our drinking habits? An insight into the world of fine wine now on BBC Two, beginning with wine merchants and a taste of a bygone era. Berry Brothers and Rudd is the oldest wine merchant in the world. Vintner to the Queen, located in the heart of London's clubland and opposite St James's Palace, it is the bastion of a very British brand. Today, as there has always been, a berry remains at the helm. I do believe passionately in family businesses, but I also believe that for family businesses to work, the families have to work very hard at them if it's just looked as somewhere for uh, the unemployable members of the family to find employment, then uh, family businesses don't last very long, and they certainly don't last for, for 308 years. But this is no ordinary family firm. The reality is that Berries has adapted itself to a world in which the super-rich hold sway, and for whom fine wine has become a must-have commodity. Berries has stores as far away as Shanghai and Hong Kong. Although the business has thrived on the New World Order, it isn't New World wines that flow through the company's veins. 80% of trade still depends on two venerable regions. Bordeaux, land of claret, is traditionally associated with big money, and Berries has hired a buyer suited and booted for the role. A wine moment, definitely. Burgundy is an intimate world of small-scale production where the oh-so-temperamental Pinot Noir reigns supreme. And here, too, Berries has carefully paired its man with the wine. It's almost an imperial purple colour. This is the wine that makes me think of the Iron Fist and the Velvet Glove. Prices for both regions' wines have hit new heights, reaping the rewards of global economic boom. But this is the year in which high finance will catch a fever, and the very certainties that underpin Berry's world will be sorely tested. For Berry's well-heeled customers, St. James's Street is the public face, but appearances can be deceptive and the company's beating heart lies elsewhere. In Basingstoke, where Berries has its headquarters and where 300,000 cases of wine are stored. So, Samuels, good morning. Good morning. Uh, rampant, thank you. Really good. <laughs> Simon Staples is the world's biggest buyer of fine Bordeaux wines. A lot of these are speculative, not speculative, but investment style wines. The first growth from 2005, you know, all about £10,000 a case now. But Mouton, for instance, is 6300 So we're suggesting to the customers who want to put wine in for investment that that's an extremely good wine. So in the next few months, that should get close to the 10000 Pound. And that's the difficult threshold to get over £10,000, we think. You know, it's a bit like the 999, it's a psychological, you know, and once it goes past that, it'll probably free run up to £20,000. For a case? Mm-hmm, yeah. What, what, what would be, what would you... I mean, we sold a case of uh, Petrus 2005, two, two in fact this week, for £35,000 a case. And it's not ready to drink for 20 years. We get phone calls at all weird times, night and day from customers generally in restaurants and things like that saying so they've just popped the loo and gone, what do I choose between this and that? Obviously it's only the good customers that have got our mobile numbers and things like that, but it happens all the time. But we, we dish these out to some of the um, sales guys during the year. It's a, a novelty value. Desk-based cruise missile launcher. 
and you've got your headset on and you don't actually realise you see it suddenly are aware that it wheels round to you and it's pointing at you. It's got a fantastic noise when it launches. I suppose I inspired the series. Could be right, could be not. Not sure. It is a nickname around work, is that I'm called Tony. I don't... I think it's the lack of hair. You can do that one. We use this for shat owners that don't apply to our pricing <coughs> structure. Mm. High above the vines, and a world away from Basingstoke, Jasper Morris is Berry's man in Burgundy, where he and his wife have had a base for the last 15 years. After a while, you get a feel for the stones. You can just pick a stone up and think, I know where that one's going to fit, like, like, like a jigsaw um, problem. It's my choice for leisure activity, instead of playing golf or going skiing or going to the beach. Uh, this is what I like doing. Wine is very much the passion, and I don't always make the most hard-headed decisions, but I do know how to make the sums add up. I've been very involved distributing producers, and that, that's how it is. When you feel hungry, you go and taste something for the first time, and you think, I want that. I don't want some other merchant getting their paws on that. You know, I want to be the person who, who has the chance to buy that and distribute it. Strange and worrying times in the financial world. Credit crunch. The banks are accusing to know each other. There have been all sorts of dire predictions for 2008. At the beginning of the year, the first gusts of a chill economic wind are starting to fall. An awful lot of people are saying, OK, well, I don't trust the money markets right now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest a bit more in wine. Um, so the world has changed, uh, and I don't want to stand here and say, uh, we're not going to be affected by, by, by economic conditions throughout the world. Uh, of course we are, every business is, but it's a more complicated world right now. Uh, and frankly, I think that wine is still an extremely good investment and that people will continue to look to it. The great advantage about wine, of course, is that even if it's not worth as much as it was the era before, it will probably taste better. Um, so at least you get to drink your in row investment, even if you can't cash it in. Wine is an industry dictated by the seasons. And at the start of the year, Berry Brothers holds its sales jamboree for Burgundy wines. Jasper has invited over all his producers to showcase their wares, and Britain's wine press to taste them. The reigning queen of wine criticism, Jancis Robinson, is in attendance. Armed with a portable video recording device. So, right, Jasper. So make myself look beautiful. Yes. I'm just getting my red tie and sort of okay. my red face. No? So, Jasper, why have the prices gone up so much? Which prices have gone up? Show me a price so that's gone many, up. So many of them have gone up so much. Most of the reds are stable or even slightly down. I mm. can't immediately think, apart from one, where we haven't released the price yet. It's mm. too frightening. Yet. <laughs> so it is, at the moment, um, a seller's market, which is interesting, given the state of the world economies. So why aren't you a politician, Jasper? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I like my wine too much. <laughs> Right, guys. Customers coming 5.30. Some of them may arrive early, and we'll probably let them in from about 5.15. All the tables are manned by Burgundians. We need to be careful with these spittoons, because when they get full, they suddenly all get full at the same time, and they start leaking on the floor. Everybody happy? Everybody ready? Yep. Good. Enjoy. Sell, sell, sell. <coughs> Yes. 300 top customers have been invited, the criteria for entry being a discerning palate and a bulging wallet. Berries represent some of Burgundy's most eminent producers, and the wine on sale today costs up to £1,200 a case. But there's also room for Jasper's newest recruit, and the cheapest kid on the block is offering one of his wines for just £7 a bottle. So, David Clark, about whom I wrote um, a year ago, interesting new domain in Moray Saint-Denis, 
owned by um, a Scot who used to work for Williams. And is it fun to be here to feel you've arrived with the big boys? Uh, it's, it's a little bit stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, because you're presenting your wines, of course, and they're, they're being judged, and you don't necessarily know how they're being judged. Um, so, it, obviously, I'm delighted to be here, um, and just to be in this company. David, um, start with some whites, reds. Some customers are granted the personal touch, and Jasper guides the former Home Secretary towards his latest protégé and hopefully a sale. Okay, very good. And what are, you, what are you selling for at the moment? Um, I think there's the 2006 is nine. Borrow the, borrow the sheet. Yes. Uh, I think it's nine pounds a pound. Yes. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. That yeah. Friends tell me what I should do is I should just put a drop of wine in, in the glass and I should pour it out and I should spend the whole evening just uh, with the bouquet and the aroma, <laughs> right. and then I, I do my health far more good. No, that's a your, your friends are all together too pretentious, right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Bordeaux is the lifeblood of Berry Brothers. With its vast estates, the region can provide the volume Berries requires. Berry's most important task each year is to buy and sell the latest vintage. But word on the street about the 07s is not good. It was a season marred by a cold, wet summer. In February, Simon and a colleague, Oli, have come for a sneak preview at Chateau de Tetre in Margot. That's jammy, baby. That's I'm astonished. In Bordeaux, wine is sold while still in barrel, at least a year before it's bottled. It's a future system known as en primeur, and its combative spirit is reflected in the fact that merchants and chateaus refer to it as a campaign. So the fog is obviously going to ruin 2008. <laughs> is, that, is that one of the...? It's the lucky eight, my dear friend. Uh, <laughs> and the unlucky number seven. No, the, the fog is lifting, you will see. Mm. Like it's always interesting when people, they always say, or oh, seven is being because of being a very uh, challenging, difficult vintage, people, they always like and every, to say... And every vintage with the seven has been rubbish. It's 47. 47. Don't forget the, the last. last. Yes, yes. <laughs> kind of a long time ago. Yes. Yeah. You can't afford to make that wine. We can't That's afford to sell it. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> the en primeur system suits the chateaus, as it means they get cash in advance. But for merchants, the annual frustration is that they never know when the wine will be released or how much it is going to cost. Ballpark price-wise, do you need 20 year ish Yes, around that. Right there. A little bit more. So after haggling. Yeah. That's, exactly That's your job, not mine. <laughs> we are peasants, we don't speak about... We don't know how to sell a case of wine. Good, good, good. Even though the wine here is better than expected... Ciao, ciao, bella pasta. With the gathering economic gloom, the chateaus will have to get the price right if Staples is going to buy it. Uh, you know, a successful campaign like um, 2005 is, you know, £60 million pounds of, of turnover. Um, the margin is very small, unfortunately, because of the huge competitive nature of uh, on Premier itself. If we get it wrong on the buying side of things, i.e. we're hanging on to stock for two or three years, economically we're losing money on it. So we have to make sure, A, we buy the right wines from quality level, which is the most, most important thing. And then we don't buy too much stock of wines we don't necessarily think are that great. Four hundred miles to the northeast of Bordeaux is an entirely different wine culture, still firmly on Berry's map. Through accidents of history and geography, Burgundy is divided into thousands of tiny vineyards. But although Burgundians like to view themselves as simple rural folk, the last 20 years have seen a gold rush. The Grand Jour de Bourgogne is a week-long event for producers to show off their wines. And Jasper is prospecting for new talent. Not everyone catches his eye. But over the years, he's discovered many of the producers who are today considered stars, with price tags to match. Thank you.
façon de, de travailler. Donc, oui. à partir de là, il faut, faut adapter cette, euh, cette I talked the hind legs off a donkey, but uh, I had to hear all about the philosophy and all about everything to do with uh, the vineyard sites and what he wants to do. But the wines are very good, and I'll definitely be following him up. The results? Probably. Result? Probably. I haven't looked at the prices yet, so uh, that's not really important. You find the right wine, and then you rule it out if the price is wrong. And with some of them, some people the price is discussable, some people the price is the price, but uh, you know, you make that. Um, oh, he's, uh, he's less than I thought. That's good. Normally, when you get that much talk beforehand, it, it means there's going to be a hefty price tag afterwards. Well, that could be exciting, that. You have to make the judgment on the person as well as on the um, wine that you're tasting. Because when I started the business, when I first went out in my own small business as an importer, I was 23, I simply didn't have the first idea. Uh, how to judge a wine, but I could make some sort of judgment of the people. I continue to use that as a large part of the judgment, of the character of the person. Not a question of whether they're nice and friendly and sort of take you out to lunch. It's not that at all. It's whether they really have the passion for what they're doing. David Clark was recruited by Jasper in 2006 just two years after he produced his first bottle of Burgundy. He gave up his career as an engineer in Formula One racing to answer the call of the vine. It actually becomes quite enjoyable, this, uh, when you, you get into a rhythm and uh, you, have, you have spare mental energy to, to, to think about other things. And, what, what, what other things do you think about? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I think I daydream more than daydream more than deep thought. But it's very, it's very satisfying. Um, there's a there's a this satisfaction of uh, of creating something in the wines. Burgundy is a land where location is everything. Each square inch under vine has been ranked in a classification system. Just a few meters can make all the difference. On the other side of this road is one of Burgundy's great sites, whose wines can sell for hundreds of pounds a case. On David's side of the road, where he has one of his vineyards, wines will usually sell for a few euros a bottle. But in Burgundy, there's only one way to start, small. I, I do a, a blog which I update every every three weeks or every month, just um, just with the the news from the growing season or whatever news from from the domain. Initially, when I when I started, I was getting maybe five unique visitors a day, um, of which I'm sure at least one was my mother, <laughs> um, and and now I'm up to seventy or eighty unique visitors a day. Status in Burgundy depends on more vines in the better Appellation. David, assisted by his parents, is retrellising his latest acquisition, which at half a hectare has increased the size of his empire by a third. Is, is, is it planned one day to find a, a Mrs. David Clark from Creative Clark Dynasty in Burgundy? <laughs> is this an advert? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Somebody be asking who paid you to do that. <laughs> you never know, yes. Isn't marriage a sort of good way of consolidating your vineyard? Yeah, it's the traditional way of uh, of getting access to more vineyards, obviously. It's to, hence all the all the du double barreled names you see in Burgundy. I haven't had any propositions yet. I don't have enough vines, I think that's the trouble. <laughs> Most of us have never seen anything quite like Bear this. Stern, it's one of Wall Street's biggest investment banks, has imploded. Sleepless nights, worrying about money problems, something more and more of us. Stock markets around the world tumbled yesterday. Bank shares were the hardest hit of all. As the rumble of economic bad news continues, a reporter from the BBC Breakfast Show has turned up to find out the impact on the fine wine trade. 
It is the eve of the Bordeaux en Primeur week, when the international wine trade flocks to the region. But at the moment, it's the exchange rate that's causing most concern. How much of a problem is the strength of the euro for you as a wine importer? Well, at this exact moment in time, it's actually pretty horrendous. Now, obviously, we're looking at a vintage which is very similar to last year, but we're at a 15% upgrade in price. Now, whether our customers will take this or not in the UK is highly unlikely. Now, also, we're up against our competition to buy the best luxury products that these wines are now conceived as all over the world with currencies that are extremely, you know, much stronger than ours. So it, this is a huge problem for us. Uh, in general terms, how much of a hit will you take? We might ha conceivably have to sell it at cost price to stay in the market, to compete, to compete with our French neighbours. What, what do you think about having to do that? It hurts. It really does. <laughs> Bordeaux represents 70% of Berry's total turnover, and the buying team has arrived in force, including Jasper, whose experienced palate has been drafted in. With the double whammy of a poor vintage and a turbulent economic environment, this year Berry's will have to choose carefully whose wines they want to buy. There you go. Since the turbulence started last year, We've been expecting it to hit the fine wine market completely, and I do feel somewhere we're on a precipice that uh, any, you know, if something more significant than someone like Bear Stern goes under, we could, I mean, the whole world will collapse down on the financial level, and of course that will affect wines. One of Berry's most long-standing relationships is with Chateau Cos d'Estournel. In a region where high prices denote high status, Jean-Guillaume Prats has forged a reputation for pushing prices as high as the market will bear. Today, his immediate concern is to impress the wine merchants and critics that are about to descend on his chateau. Their feedback will inform his decision about how much to charge for the wine. It's a little bit of a game in fixing the prices. Because today, I have no idea what will be the price of Cosestronel 2007, and I should find out in the next month or so. Um, so it's a game of how well we have performed, um, how well we have performed compared to the other chateaus. Um, what is the market looking at? Is Bordeaux 2007 going to be recognized as a, a good vintage, a bad vintage, a modest vintage, an extraordinary vintage? What are going to be the economical and political situation around the world in the next two or three months? All that is important, and to mention the currencies. So it's a little bit of a game. I would not say a poker game, but it's a, a game where we have to, to make the right decision at the right time. We say in Bordeaux that we tend to produce the vintage um, uh, of the millennium every five years. Uh, well, then 2007 is certainly not the, villain, the vintage of the millennium, but it's, it's a vintage with, which will give immediate pleasure. It's not made for the very long aging, like 50 years or so. Uh, it's a wine which uh, will be immediately ready for drinking soon after bottling. I have to let the chateaus know that, you know, the euro is a significant problem for us at the moment. I think we're always seen as the bad dogs with the chateaus. By, it looks as though we're trying to push the prices down and down. It's not. We want to get it to a price which is right. Some vintages they listen, sometimes they don't. And with the 2005 vintage, virtually everything we tasted was magnificent. And some chateaus went for a field day on it. In 2006, a lot of them should have reined their prices in considerably more than they had. I think this may be a reality check for prices this year. I hope, anyway. It's nine o'clock, it must be cause. <laughs> because, because. Union Jack. Good. It's the right way around. Yes, yeah. Give you a bit more, it's, it's still free. Is that just generally for you? Yeah, just for you, just for you. Berries bought its first bottle of Cos in at least 1855. But despite the antiquity of the relationship, there is no guarantee that Simon will buy the wine if he doesn't think he will be able to sell it. And with 252,000 bottles of the 07 vintage, Jean Guillaume has plenty to sell. It's going to be um, tricky this year. We say it every year, I know we say it's going to be very tricky, but I think it's going to be harder than last year. Tricky in which sense? Well, 
euro, economic collapse verging, you know, every, every day looks, as though it's, looks dreadful around the world, customers have bought for the last six or seven vintages, What's the appeal to buy 07? That's the. Uh... Don't you feel that I, I receive I receive that, but don't you feel that your customer will still continue to purchase a small numbers of wine that uh, very is well recognized? Without, without a doubt, that, that you know I, I've produced some very good wine this year. Mm -hmm. If the price, which I have no idea what the price will be, is in the line of the of, of the market, then then certainly it makes sense. Mm. Certainly makes sense. Beautifully diplomatic. Yes. We are French. <laughs> <laughs> So not only we're always right, but we know how to express it. <laughs> so generally speaking, John Guillaume is very upfront. He's aggressive in his pricing structure. I would suggest that's probably the best way to describe it. And uh, in the last three or four vintages, he has pushed his price to such a point where we have walked away from, I mean, we walked away from the 2006 vintage. Um, I think we bought about 60 cases, and in 2005, we sold 2,000 cases. So a significant drop off for us, but again, the pricing was wrong. So that's, you know, it's nice to stir it up a little bit. As Jean-Guillaume's efforts to win over his visitors continue, Team Berry retire to another chateau for lunch to discuss what they might be prepared to pay for a case of COS. What price were we selling COS 06 for last year? 720 um, 20 pounds a yeah. case. And what, what do we think it should be this year, judging by the quality and vintage and euro and everything else? What do we reckon we should be selling it for? I'm, th I'm thinking in the region of £30 a bottle, so 360 yeah, 390 a case. Okay. But to be good value, and I think this is, this is what a vintage like 07 needs to be. It's not a speculator's vintage. Mm -hmm. Anyone that buys it is likely going to end up drinking that case of wine that they buy because it, it simply won't go up in value a great deal. I think £30 a bottle is a nice catchy number um, and it could be a price that works certainly better than last year. So basically you're expecting a 50% drop in price and cost? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In order for it to be a success in our market, that is what's That's required. what we need, yeah. If the prices aren't lower, then we have to say, sorry boys, we're out for a year. I think it'll be 50 or 60 euros. I disagree, I think it'll be much more expensive than that. It'll be the same price as last year. Bet you. I'll bet you a case of this white guard. <laughs> Superb. <laughs> <Tell you. laughs> in Bordeaux, the pricing mechanism is an elaborate flirtation where the chateaus work out how many suitors they have before declaring their hand. In Burgundy, with spring in the air, the dance is more intimate and cuts to the chase more quickly. At Domaine David Clark, the deal with berries has already been sealed. So David doesn't need to woo Jasper anymore. But he must still impress him with the quality of his latest vintage in order to bargain over the price. Once you get past the aromatics, which are to do with the um, malolactic, yep. obviously clear mm. up. It's a really beautiful Pinot fragrance. Where's it going to fit price-wise? I mean, obviously, um, I'm thinking. Too early. Well, I, I was, I was thinking of of keeping the prices as they are for the past two grand yes. and the Bourgogne, so yeah. six, eight. Um, I was thinking 11 for the Cote de Nuit Village, the Moray, which has been 14. I was thinking Should of up. putting up to 16, perhaps. Yeah, um, yeah. In retrospect, having, it was yes. too cheap. Yes. It. Should, it could have been more. Yes, yeah. having seen that it was it, it was cheaper than all the other Moray Sandinese offered yeah. on Primor. That's lovely. It's got a real follow through there. It's, um, I think it's quite clearly the best wine that I've made to date. <laughs> but, I'll go um, along with that. Yeah. yeah. Monsieur has permission to increase his price. <laughs> right. 
In the minutely parcelated world of Burgundy, almost every plot of land has multiple owners and all do things differently, even idiosyncratically. David has created a vineyard buggy and is working on his most prestigious vines, the Moray Saint-Denis, where he owns five rows that produce one barrel a year and whose price has just been renegotiated. The 2006 was 14 euros, the 2007 is going to be 16 euros. So what, what difference does that make overall with the, on the, I can't quite do the maths on it, with the, how many bottles? Three? Uh, it makes 600 euros difference to me. <laughs> it's worthwhile. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a high turnover business. <laughs> How would you sort of characterise relations with Jasper and, and, and the Berrybos? We, we both need each other in the sense that uh, we're, and you know, we're both we're both making a profit on the on the work. Um, I think it's very it's very sort of evenly split at the moment. And they're certainly very important to me. They buy half the harvest, and and it's it's nice to be attached to such a well-known name. The wine trade is long term. The wine trade's all about things taking a long time to happen, whether it's uh, you're thinking about planting a vineyard and knowing that it's going to be another generation before it's re really producing wine so at its very best. And, and family businesses are good at thinking long term. You don't have shareholders knocking on the door every quarter saying, yes, but what's happening to short term improvements in profit? Um, and as a result, a business like ours does work in the same way as the rest of, of the trade. OK, if we just put recommended. As chairman of the business, Simon Berry pays meticulous attention to detail, literally dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the new price list. The list is a resurrection of an old practice when it was designed to fit into a gentleman's waistcoat pocket. It looks better, he says. Emphatically, if we take out at the end of of descriptions of wines, when it's at the end of a line, if we take out the comma, I've already taken them out. <laughs> I knew I liked you. Sorry. Brilliant. No, fantastic. Not the problem. other thing is, I'm afraid I hate with a passion that I can hardly begin to describe to you. Okay. Your first, first port, port of call. Port. That's fine. We put that in there just... To annoy me. That, not just to annoy you. I also would... I mean, and this is a tiny point, but worth considering. Um, we've started to put everything in caps down the bottom there. Yep. Which, again, we, we never did... Be, be, well, and we never did be before. Known. And probably you'll yeah. find if we didn't do it before, it's for a pretty good reason. Yeah. Actually, original because it was... As ever, appearances are deceptive. The intention of the new old price list is to direct customers to Berry's website. Concealing the iron fist of innovation in the velvet glove of tradition is not unique to Berry Brothers. Cos d'Estournel is one of the top chateaus in Bordeaux and featured in a sort of league table drawn up in 1855. Just five chateaus are in the tier known as the first growths and the tragedy of Cos d'Estournel is that it isn't one of them. But in an audacious bid to challenge the status quo, Jean-Guillaume is creating a state-of-the-art winery that he hopes will give Coz the edge. We want to produce something which is perceived as the best wine in Bordeaux. It's like a Formula One racing. Uh, to, to win uh, the Monaco Grand Prix, Lewis Hamilton um, made a tremendous effort, and that half a second uh, that made him winning the Monaco Grand Prix. That half second is a huge amount of investment in aerodynamic, in tires, in oil, in design, in power, as well as in the mood of the pilot and many other things. For us to produce that extra length, that extra density, that extra harmony, that extra balance, that extra complexity that made Scott Destornet even greater is an extraordinary amount of investment and risk taking and details. That's what we're trying to achieve, and we're trying to achieve clearly to be the number one. Special humidifiers will keep the cellar in optimal conditions. While a sort of catwalk will allow visitors to gawp at the wine, they probably will never be able to afford. How much is all this, all this costing? 
It's a substantial investment. As I said, we can afford to invest in Bordeaux and at Cosa Stornel because we have a large estate. Um, we produce a certain large numbers of bottles that give us the opportunity to invest into quality and long-term thinking, and this is the best example. Can you put a figure on it? No. The key point is by how much is it going to increase the quality, and are we going to produce a better wine than we're producing today? And the answer is, I think, yes. The City of London provides berries with some of its best customers, but they don't just drink the wine. They trade it. Thank you. 630 euros sur live ex. Magnum 96. Are you in on the spread then? No, you're not. 30 to 36 magnums of mature Bordeaux at 700 pounds a case. No less than 10 cases. Nice. There's even a stock market for fine wine. The London International Vintners Exchange, or Livex. Today at Livex, it's one of the most important days of the year when the world's most influential wine critic, the American Robert Parker, releases his scores for Bordeaux wines. The first rumor came out of the US. It suggested there are only a couple of hundred point wines, which seems extreme, but might be true. I can uh, put you through to him. In a world where knowledge is power, the live ex traders are trying to get wind of what Parker has pronounced before he's pronounced it. It essentially said that Angelou got 99 points, Cheval Blanc 100, and Latour 96, all untrue. Robert Parker is um, the world's leading critic on fine wine, specifically Bordeaux. He has arguably too much, but he has tremendous influence. Uh, chateaus will wait to release the prices according to what he gives them. With current um, exchange rate problems that the UK and the Americans are facing with the euro and things like this, people will be keen for him to give some good scores to, to give a bit of a kickstart start to a market or to a campaign that's looking quite weak at the moment. The press have not been very positive on it. They're nice wines, attractive wines to drink early. They're not speculative wines. I think we'll come back tomorrow. Great. OK, see you. Speak soon. Bye. Despite LiveX's best efforts, Parker keeps his points to himself. Great. Will you do the uh, windows, Adam? Yeah. Doing business is one thing, but perception the consumer has is another thing. And, and we must not forget that down the road, the people who are buying these bottles are buying because it's a farming product, it's a wine product, and that's important. And that's exactly what we do on an everyday basis. We are farmers, so we should not never forget that. For Jean-Guillaume, the decision about price is the most important of the year. Too low, and it's the merchants who will make the money. Too high, and no one will buy the wine. Everything from the mood of the market to the views of Robert Parker are weighed up before the decision is made. It's more that the, your clients um, are willing to consider the 2007 ad bottling. So now it's a time either to decide to put a price on the vintage or not to release it. We are today at Cosa Stornel in the mood not to release, but this could change. Uh, and maybe we change our mind next week or maybe tomorrow morning. Why? Simply because it seems that the overall ambiance around the 07 vintage is not very good. It's not a quality problem. Simply the overall perception of the vintage in Bordeaux uh, is, is not as, as flamboyant as we would like it to be. In Basingstoke, Simon Staples can't do any business on the 07s until the chateaus make up their minds. Well, we're sitting here still waiting for prices to come out of Bordeaux. So they launched their product onto the market, what, three weeks ago? And nothing. It's like tumbleweed blowing through here. But, you know, through emails and things like that, we just know nothing's actually happened this morning. So we just have to get on and do other things. Every chateau owner just waits for Parker. Strange way of doing business. And I think this year as well, particularly with so many poor wines, they are taking a huge, huge gamble to, you know, if they wait and then Parker gives them 82 to 84 points, no one's going to touch their wine. Whereas if they come out and release their price now, if we think the wine is good and other merchants think it's good, it'll sell. 
But literally, that'll, that'll put um, you know, a complete damper on their particular wine, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of those this year. At the beginning of May, Parker pronounces. And although Cos itself has done well, his verdict on the 07 vintage as a whole cements the already dismal impression. Cos 2007 is 90 to 93 points. There are a lot of, lot of 88, 89, 90 point wines in 2007, so it's going to be a challenge to sell it. It's going to be a challenge unless the Chateau bring the prices down quite significantly. As it stands now, it's up to the Chateau to be yeah, sensible yeah, with their prices. Uh... So it's all about the price. Jean-Guillaume's Parker score is identical to his first growth neighbour, Chateau Lafitte. But because of the 1855 classification, he won't be able to charge a first growth price. In June, Jean-Guillaume goes for drinks at a less august neighbour, also in the Saint-Estephe Appellation of Bordeaux. Is there any sort of competition between the two? No, 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 no. We, we are... We, we are a very good friend, and uh, there's certainly not a sense of competition, but uh, being part of the same appellation, the same large family. Whose wines are more expensive? Of course, he's more expensive than La Forger. Because? Because the market says so. Are they better? I didn't say that. The market says so. Ellie. In Bordeaux, when coming up with a price, talking to the neighbours is all part of the decision-making process. We're not trying to be arrogant. We simply don't know what to do. It's a very difficult call to make a price. And it's a very difficult call when the ambiance and the market is not in a good mood. Therefore, you need to have enhanced all the elements uh, to be able to make that call. And, um, and that's the only reason why we wait, is simply because we, we are not sure of making the right decision. So I can understand Simon's type of frustration. I can understand the frustration of the consumers. If we don't make it, it's simply we are not sure to be right. And we just don't want to be wrong. In Burgundy, it is the height of summer. Nice ride. I'm christened him Hengist, Hengist the horse. Uh, but in fact, Hengist turns out to be the Anglo Saxon word for stallion. He's not a stallion. He could have been a stallion, but <laughs> had the operation. Jasper is busy working on a tome about the top thousand Burgundian producers. I always think there's a much more human touch here in, in Burgundy. It's less big business. It's much more about the interaction between the individual human being and his vines and vineyard. So that's what I hope will come out in the book. And also, it ties in very nicely with my, with, with my work, because all the research I'm doing, discovering New information about vineyards also brings me in touch with producers I hadn't met before. And uh, when I find the right one, then snap them up for Berry Brothers. Absolutely. David has furnished Jasper with a plot development. He has bought eight rows of vines in Burgundy's most prestigious appellation, Vaune Romane, home to the most expensive wine on the planet, Domaine Romane Conti. Is this going to make you a sort of irresistibly eligible sort of bachelor of, 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 uh, of Burgundy? <laughs> it, it might if I actually had any of those vineyards. <laughs> if I was, uh, if I if I owned any uh, Richebourg, for example, or uh, obviously uh, this is that uh, this is uh, you know here we're down on the not quite the peasants' wine, but it's, uh, it's becoming a little bit more affordable. Do, do, do you feel sort of uh, sort of removed from credit punches and all the rest of it? Uh, well, so far, touch wood. So 
different from Bordeaux, isn't it? In, in the, you know, the prices in Bergen don't fluctuate in the same way. No, that's right. Regardless of the, of the quality of the harvest, people in, in Burgundy growers tend to tend to try and maintain quite steady prices. So if the even if the harvest is exceptional, the, the price the price of the wine from the domain will will remain roughly the same. Jasper is on his way to the new vineyard, both to research his book and to make sure he gets a piece of the action. And here it is. There's eight and two third rows. Um, eight and two, two thirds. thirds yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> we we'll start. We we'll start here. Yeah. Um, How's the year been from the point of view of um, disease? Has it been uh, all right? It, it's, I think it's been quite difficult generally. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, this vineyard's this close looks to spotless. Well, exactly. Yeah. I haven't um, seen anything here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also, I've bought a new, uh, I bought a new sprayer. A new this, sprayer? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, a, it's an atomizer, um, but on, uh, you know, it's, uh, on wheels. Is it, is it just assumed that Berries will buy this, uh, this wine and David will sell it to, to...? The deal at the moment is that we take half of what David produces, sort of, like, given any whatever the cuvee, so I'm very much assuming that he will be kind enough to offer us half of this in due course. Yes, certainly. <laughs> it's and my, that, uh, it's he my will, expectation. And he will make it well enough that we shall want to buy half of it, so... Yes. Well, I think this is very promising, David. Yeah. We'll see, uh, Look forward to seeing it at harvest time and then uh, and tasting the produce. Tasting with you after yeah. that, yeah. yes. Wine is a business in which endless uncertainties follow a strict calendar. The weather may be good or bad. The grapes may flourish or perish. But the reckoning always comes when it's time to harvest. And the wine trade must also obey the dictates of the seasons. At Cos des Tournelles, the most ambitious cellar project anyone can remember has been completed on schedule. And Jean Guillaume has finally settled on a price. Clearly, there was not the, the fire, the interest that um, we have seen on the 2005 vintage. The O7 was offered uh, from the border trade to, to Bay Brothers and, and a few others at 65 euro uh, per bottle. It's below 100 euro a bottle, which is a very expensive for a bottle of wine. We are fully aware of that. But if you compare it to the prices you have to pay for the first growth, with totally modesty, I think, I tend to believe that maybe Cos is as good as the first grow, or not too far from their quality. Then when you buy Cos Estonel, you buy a first grow quality at uh, one third, one fourth of the price. So I don't think so that it's too expensive. Berry Brothers is a very strong partner to Cos Estonel. Our utmost interest is that Berry Brothers is in the position to, to please the demand from the consumers and to sell our wine. So our interest is to listen to Simon, to listen to what he says and to his feelings and advice. Um, and and we, are, we are in great marriage with Berry Brothers. If Berry Brothers is successful, then it's good for us, as simple as that. So of course we exchange, but we like to, it's probably the old um, English-French war, uh, nothing more than that. In Basingstoke, the Emprimeur campaign has ground to a halt. Simon has spent just 10 of his 60 million pound budget on the 2007 vintage. How much, how much cost did you buy? Uh, probably about 10 cases. Seriously, only 10 cases? Oh, okay. Yeah. Wrong price, wrong time, as we established before it was even released, as we, if you recall. It was the wrong price for the rub market at the time. What were you telling your customers? In, it's in... too expensive, don't bother. The wine industry is above all about relationships. There will be future vintages of COS that berries want to buy and a benign economy in which to sell it. And so it is with a nod to the past and an eye to the future that Jean Guillaume has been invited to St. James as the guest of honour. 
Some of Berry's most favored customers from the world of high finance have been invited. And even though Simon has urged them not to buy the stuff, COS 07 is being served as an aperitif. This is a treat. It's very, it's very seductive, though. So if you'd given it to us on April the 10th, we'd have... <laughs> Such is hindsight, eh? Such is so hindsight. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. How's the 07 campaign? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that as a you, warm you, up, you, you should ask him about the 08 campaign. <laughs> the greatest division of all time. Um, uh, sluggish is probably the best way to describe it. How, how would you describe it? S um, slow, like slow, a snail. Slow, okay. Like a snail. But uh, no, it's not been easy. But, uh, <laughs> Jean Guillaume and his fellow guests have been warned that the evening's entertainment will be a blind tasting, and the centerpiece is two bottles of Cos d'Estournelle from 1870. They haven't moved from the berry cellar for almost 140 years. After all this time, you just really, really hope it's good. Ain't looking good. Cork wise, right? so let's see. That's not moving. So we have a decanter in front. Oh my word. Did you hear that? It's like. <gasps> that, folks, is it. That's a cork from an 1870 bottle. Um, I can't believe the colour and the clarity of that. That's amazing, isn't it? That's all right. That's actually all right. Thirsty? Oh, are you going to...? Oh, right. that's, 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 that's a bit more... Pungentia. Actually, the one. actually, that's not bad either. This is all right. I can't actually believe it. This is all right. Some fun with them now. <laughs> 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 where we embarrass ourselves in front of everybody by getting it completely and utterly wrong. Now, if you've got to, you've got to dig deep, deep well, on this. And the, 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 the fruit is still. Well, the nerve look at the colour. Oh, the, the, the colour is fantastic. Uh, to be honest, I was, I was worried about it, but I actually think it's actually coming out of it. So yeah, literally, we just pulled yeah. the cork on this now. So it's just like, now. Yeah, just, just in case. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. It's French. Wow. Uh, that part I would never have I have to say. Are you going to be no, Bordeaux? No, that's Bordeaux. That's we know. It's Bordeaux. I think it's Bordeaux and Medoc, isn't it? It is Bordeaux and Medoc. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Take it easy. And, and I think the nose is the most important part of it. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so, actually, start vintage, what do you reckon? Thank you for dropping me in it. <laughs> You're at the end of the table and, well, that's just where it goes. Yes. Um... Oh, look at this. This is like being on Mastermind. It, it is rather. It is. <laughs> You've dropped me right in it. I'm going to... It's good, though, isn't it? It is good. Mm. I think it's younger than I suspect. I was going to say 70. Yeah. So oh. it's slightly younger than that. I'm going to go for... I'm going to go for 82. OK. Might be 89, but I'm going to go for 82. Okay. I've said 89. 89? Yeah. Federico. Vinny. To be honest, I'm, I'm closer to Ashley, probably an 82 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm listening to what you're telling me, that you're absolutely staggered by it. Um, and I'm thinking it's, it's, it's round about the 40s, 50s, earlier 30s. 
something like that. You're covering three decades there, Ian. Okay. You are covering your bases. Well, you listen, sorry. OK, but well, of course I've drunk such vast quantities of all of those decades that I ought to be able to be more precise. I will go for oh, a... Uh, uh, I will go late 40s. Late 40s. Bob. Come on, you've been to La Tour, you had the old ones. Yeah, 55. I have a late change of mind here, I think. 55. Oh, oh no, we're no, really no, 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 I think he's really young. He's really young? Yeah, 50s. 50s. He's <laughs> really young at 50s. 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 So you're going back, yeah, you're I'm going... I'm going back to 64. 64's very interesting. Jean Guillaume coming for the final 64, I think I can say I had something similar. I think it's seriously old. It's... I was tempted first to say 49 because it's mm. it's it's a wine which has a lot of acidity. It's, it's very intense and very green, but I think the 49s are slightly more acidic. And then I changed my mind maybe to 28. Mm. Uh, so I think it's 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 a middle 28. I don't think so. It's 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 a Margot or Saint Julien. So it's either Pouillac or Saint Estef. Giving the name is impossible. So I would say it's, it's a Pouillac or Saint Estef, fairly old, maybe maybe 28. I think so, or 29. Right, so that's a big call. It's, um, Coz. OK. And now we have to find the vintage. I'll, I'll help you. It's 1870 Coz. Oh, my God. OK. You are so well, it's, it's, Oh, my God. This bottle has never left the building. It, it has never... It has never moved from where it was stored no. downstairs. No. no. I mean, it, I, it, oh, astonished. But I mean, my, I, but I've, my, heard, my, I have, I've heard my father saying on numerous occasions it's the greatest vintage he ever had. Really? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, on numerous occasions, yeah. Oh, I love my job. I'm amazed. So the question for Jean Guillaume, is this your greatest cause experience? <laughs> when you yes, because I don't have to pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last time I had to pay for it, oh, oh, I had to pay for the electricity. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we've got a bit of a communication problem. <laughs> Jones closed down 500 points. It's worse than one thing. nationalising <laughs> banks to stop them collapsing. Menacing deterioration and economic conditions. There has condition not been a day like it in the modern it's history. It's no hyperbola that one can think of. It might capture the magnitude for financial markets. The of Lehman Brothers here in New York. The worst recession this country has seen in living memory. The news may be bleak, but Berries has shrugged off everything from Napoleonic wars to Nazi bombs. And whoever the new masters of the universe are in the new world order, the chances are that they'll be buying their wine from berries. Of course it's going to have some effect on us because it's going to have some effect on our customers. It's just it's very hard to gaze into a crystal ball right now and anticipate what it's going to be. I mean, certainly one of the things we've seen is that people have gone, I don't trust money and banks to have any more, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make an investment in wine. It's always said that the wine trade can survive a recession because in good times you drink to celebrate, in bad times you drink to forget. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>